Today, we are honored to have Chris from Drift Outfitters with us. Uh, he's been here before tying with us, and he's going to be tying some wonderful flies today. Uh, one thing I want to say is that every time I do a session with Chris, whether it's knots, whether it's... I'm sorry, Chris, you're like a prodigy. I mean, I just walk away, and it's always an adventure. Uh, he's done several sessions with us. He's done things like um, when I was at one of the other clubs, he had a dunk tank that he dropped in to show us how things sank. And it just opens my world to fishing each time he does it. He does competition fishing. He's competitive and he's won awards for fly tying. And he's just a repository of knowledge. Uh, again, he works out of Drift Outfitters and he also gives lessons too. So without further ado, and thank you so much for being with us, Chris, please take it away. Thanks, Brian. Too kind. <laughs> Those will be fun. Um, so yeah, uh, today we're going to talk key steelhead flies. And these are, um, the, the thing I really like to focus on is these are uh, Great Lakes inspired flies and uh, flies that will catch a fish around here. A lot of the steelhead influence that you see comes from, uh, you know, out west. And obviously they've been at this a lot longer than us. Um, but their fish are different, you know, biologically, they're fishing different rivers, they have different demands, uh, and so do we. And so it's good to, you know, take inspiration from there and, um, you know, understand sort of, you know, things that they've learned for us through trial and error so that we can skip ahead, I guess, a little bit, but also understand that our fish are fundamentally different. So you need, um, you know, to, to tweak things a little bit just to have the most success on the water. So the flies I'm focusing on today, these are all uh, flies that you'd fish on the swing. Uh, you know, you can fish uh, steelhead a few different ways, the two primary sort of tactics uh, uh, from a fly perspective would be nymphing and swimming. Nymphing uh, just being the same as what you do for resident trout, drifting something under an indicator or not. Um, and then, you know, the, this, the other most popular way to go would be to swing a fly. Um, you know, very similar to swinging a wet fly for trout. I think that's the best way I think that a lot of people get caught up sort of romanticizing, you know, swinging flies, thinking that it's some kind of foreign concept. It's really not. It's something that you're probably already familiar with. And, um, and you know, you don't need to, to break it down too much further from there. The primary difference, I think, between uh, fishing locally around here and fishing out west, a um, couple of things. One, uh, steelhead around here have been freshwater their whole lives. They haven't uh, been out in the ocean feeding on prawns and, and uh, you know, squid and things like that. They have a very different sort of forage. They have a different sort of upbringing uh, in the rivers where the small type period is much shorter in our rivers, only you know, one or two seasons versus several out west. And so the steelheads that we have here uh, don't develop the same instincts as the fish out west. They end up... Um, you know, not retaining some of the same trouty sort of instincts that you'd expect to find with fish at West, which is why our fish don't necessarily always respond as well to dry flies and, uh, you know, bugs that they'd see on the surface during that longer small type period at West. So you have a little bit of a different, um, you know, view from the fish and what they're eating. We do have, um, in some rivers, a lot of stocked fish uh, versus, you know, at West, a lot of the rivers are still wild. Uh, wild fish tend to be a lot more grabby on the swing. Uh, stocked fish tend to take more, you know, stimulation, um, you know, they respond better to, uh, you know, bright colors and things being put directly in their face. Uh, and so, you know, you've got to understand if you're fishing wild fish or stocked fish, you've got to understand what the main forage is around here. It's a lot of sculpins, it's a lot of gobies, it's smelt, it's alewife. Um, and then it's important to understand the water that we're fishing. So a lot of West Coast flies, you'll see very large flies. Um, and those are designed to grab the attention of these hot sea wind fish in big rivers where you just want to get your fly noticed. And they're also a lot of the time tied pretty heavily uh, to really bite into those heavy currents they have out west and, and stay, uh, you know, firmly in the water as you're swinging them. Around here, you know, we have much smaller systems for the most part. And even our larger systems are still relatively small by West Coast standards. And a lot of times, especially this fall, things have been so low. We have pretty clear water. Um, and so fish can see things from a far ways away. We don't need to fish all that big, uh, and we certainly don't need to fish that deep. One of my favorite things to remind people of when they're swinging flies for steelhead, a lot of guys, you know, they're familiar with nymphing, where some guys come from center paying for these fish, and they go to swinging flies for them. And so they think they need to get this fly right down, you know, to the level of the fish, which you know, a lot of time is toward, um, you know, the bottom, you know, third level of the water column. 
it's really not true. When you're swinging flies, you need, uh, you know, you're, you're targeting fairly aggressive fish. And so if they're aggressive enough to grab a swung fly, they're more than aggressive enough to come up and grab a fly closer to the surface. But the biggest thing to remember is that a fish, fish's vision, just like any animal, works on a cone. And so if a fish is down toward the bottom of the cone, you know, the, the point at which it can see the most is up at the top. You know, it can see way more toward the surface of the water column than down below. I would much rather fish, you know, too high in the water column than too low and not get noticed by a fish. Trout see the world through a skylight or circular window surrounded by a mirror. Marinaro's great insight was to recognize how trout use the position of the fly in this window to make an effective rise. Because of the laws of refraction, fish cannot see objects which lie below an angle of 10 degrees to the water surface at the edge of their window. The red triangles in these diagrams show this blind spot extending outwards all around the edge of the trout's window. This is why we adopt a stealthy approach when casting to a rising trout. We often judge where to cast our fly by noting where a trout rises to take a natural fly. But there is a flaw in this approach, which has been explained by Vince Marinaro. It turns out that trout get advanced warning of a fly long before it appears in their window. Trout are able to see parts of an insect or artificial fly that rests on or punctures the mirror. The bodies of emerging flies break through the water surface. They hang beneath the mirror. The legs of duns resting on the surface also create a light pattern that triggers the start of the rise. A number of authors have provided photographic evidence the trout can see the wings of approaching insects in their window. The wings of an insect that protrude above an angle of greater than 10 degrees to the water surface are potentially visible in the window. Therefore, a trout has two cues that an approaching object may be edible. Firstly, body parts that break through the mirror, and secondly, wings appearing in the window. As the sunk fly approaches, the fish sees two images, the actual fly and its reflection in the mirror, and then a single image when the fly crosses the edge of the fish's window. By keeping the fly on the edge of the window, the trout stands a very good chance of, of engulfing the insect. The biggest thing, I think, is speed when it comes to swinging flies. Um, you know, giving a fish a decently long chance to, to look at the fly and make up its mind and, you know, maybe it's distracted by something else, get a look at your fly, the better your chances of catching it are. And so um, speed control is very important. You want to get these flies low enough. You'll see that some of these are lightly weighted flies. The key really is get your fly down deep enough in the water column that you can control the swing and get a nice, you know, fairly slow swing. Um, but not so deep that you're out of its cone of vision. And that's really all there is to it. Um, you know, guys complicate this way more than they have to. Um, so I, I like to carry a very small selection of flies, a couple different weights for different current situations. And really that's it. Uh, I carry, you know, six, maybe five or six different patterns in my box and a couple colors, a couple weights, and, and that's it. So these are my favorites. So jabbering too much, I'll just hop into it. Um, this is a hobo spank. So I've got a, this is a little shank here. If you aren't familiar with shanks, this is the one I'm using. This is um, a Senyo's uh, steelhead shank in a 25 millimeter. You don't need a long shank for this fly. Short one's better in my mind. Um, you, just, uh, you don't need a ton. You can adjust this weight, the weight of this fly, by altering the shank length. This is a 25 mil as mentioned. You make a 40 mil, and you can get longer still. The, the, as you see, uh, the way that this fly is tied, the size is pretty well defined. Um, by the size of a marabou feather that we use. So the, the shank length doesn't alter the size of the fly, but it does alter the weight. So if you want a heavier one, you could tie it on a longer shank if you want. Um, to get going on this guy, this is a, an ADOT chartreuse thread. You'll see it's kind of like a salmon. 
I can't see that, but it's like a salmon eye where it's returned on both sides. So we've got to kind of clamp this, these two pieces of wire together. So start my thread up the eye and just quickly take it down to the back loop here. And that'll just bind those, uh, those two shanks together there. To attach a hook, because obviously we can't hook fish in this state, we're going to use a, a wire trailer. So I'll show you how this all kind of fits together in the end. But this is just a this particular one is uh, the Senyo's, there we go, uh, intruder wire. And uh, it's, it's just a soft, sort of flexible, multi-braid uh, wire strand. And you can use different materials for this. I know some guys who use uh, a monofilament, like a 1012 band. You can use... Uh, uh, so certain braided lines do work okay for it. Wire, I think, is the best because it's fairly stiff and durable. Um, you crimp the mono too much, it can kind of weaken it. But um, the wire is durable and it's stiff, which keeps your hook straight out the back of the fly. The, the braid and other options sometimes sag down below the fly, um, just kind of takes it out of the equation. So I've got a short little piece of wire here. This is uh, you know, probably four inches long. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to lay it alongside the hook here with a wire which is sort of extending past the eye by about shank length. I'm going to tie it down on one side. And these shanks, you can see it, um, they have a vertical loop on the back. This is really handy because you want this, um, this loop here to ride horizontally. So sort of around the side, if that makes sense. And by tying in the wire on either side of this vertical loop, uh, on the back here, you get a nice flat surface to keep that loop straight. Otherwise, it can twist on you pretty easily. So I really like the shanks for that reason. I'm just going to fold this wire over. I'm going to aim to make a loop off the back here. You now, if I was to pinch it down, maybe two inches long or so. Not too long. I'm going to tie that down the side. That other side, yeah. So I'm going to tie thread just over both tag ends of wire here. And to make sure that this wire doesn't pull out, I'm just going to flip my vise over. And I've got these little stubby ends here. I'm just going to fold them back over again. This wire could, be, could have been a little bit longer. Just flash my thread over there just to make sure that that doesn't slip out. A lot of people get really paranoid at this stage. They start super gluing everything. And, um, you know, folding wire back and forth. You don't need to. This is plenty strong as is. You can test it if you like. It's not going anywhere. That's in there very tightly. And you're going to further lash this in as you tie the rest of the fly. Uh, I, you can put a hook on now, but I prefer not to just because you will stab yourself through the tying of this fly. I've done it a few times. But just since this is probably the clearest picture of how this uh, Hook attaches that we're going to get. I'm just going to throw on a quick whip finish, pop this out of ice, and show you how this works. I'm going to take a pair of forceps here, and just in the back here, I'm going to pinch. I'm going to take a hook, and this hook here, this is a, an OPST swing hook. It's a barbless short shank hook, kind of like an octopus hook, very slight up eye to it. The up eye is important because it allows the line or the, the wire rather to run straight through it. I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little pointed bit of uh, wire I have here. I'm going to push it through the front end of the hook. And it's just a, like a loop-to-loop -loop connection at this point. So then I just pass the loop back over top of the hook. Like so. In this case I said it's actually hook point down. Usually we would go hook point up. Thank you. It's kind of how it Here's Anne. That's all the way down. Straighten that a little bit there. See how that catches. Usually we go that way so it's not snagged so easily if you hit a rock. That's just done by instead of cleaning the way I did, you flip the hook over beforehand and feed it through the other way. All right. Now, this is kind of a finicky part about tying the shanks. It's really simple from here. Um, all I'm going to do to start with, I want just a little hot spot on this fly. This is a trilobal dubbing made by Heroin. You could use other dubbings too, but the synthetic dubbings tend to hold their color better in the water. So if you want a hot spot, I like something synthetic. And this one has a fairly long fiber, which I like too. 
And you can use a dubbing loop for this to make it really super simple. All I'm going to do is dub this straight on. This is a pretty coarse dubbing, or not a super coarse dubbing, I should say. Um, it's a long fiber dubbing, and it's kind of springy and doesn't always like to grip your thread. So you can use some dubbing wax or a dubbing loop if you like. It makes things easier. All I'm doing here is I'm just dubbing a small amount on. And I'm not wrapping forward. I'm just wrapping over top of itself to build up a little bit of a ball back there. I just want sort of an even-sized ball. From here, got for a rib, oh, but this is just a small silver wire. You can use any wire you want. Uh, it doesn't matter the color, even really a size, small, medium, all work. Um, this is just to reinforce our body hackle a little bit. So I'll go ahead, take a short stretch of that. I it in side and for the body. What do I do for the other dubbing? Okay. This is the same dubbing running right here. This is uh, this is just black. Again, you could use anything. In this case, I don't really care if it's synthetic or not, just because black is black. It doesn't matter if it's dark on the water. Again, dub a small amount on there. Work on building this part up quite as much. I just want thinly veil that body here. You want to leave yourself a bit of room at the eye. There's a couple more materials to come out, so uh, maybe three millimeters left open at the eye there. And for our body hackle, this is just natural guinea. Guinea is a great, great hackle that you're going to want to have if you want to tie steelhead flies. Uh, what makes it nice? I mean, it's got you know this natural spotting. Uh, which does give it a nice kind of color variation and fly. Uh, but the, the really nice thing about it is just its stiffness. It's a very stiff hackle. Uh, the fibers, that is, the stem is pretty easy to work with, I'd say, but the fiber is very stiff. And when you're swinging a fly, you know, you're holding this thing back against uh, the water current. So, I mean, if you imagine the current is going, this is going to be held up into the current. Imagine the current is going this direction over the fly. It's pushing all these materials down and slicking it down. Marabou, which is kind of what this little hobo spay is built on, it's really just a marabou fly, uh, is of course a very, very soft fiber. And so if you're uh, you know, on heavier currents or heavy-ish currents, this isn't a great fly for really heavy currents in my mind. It's better for slower water. But if you even have moderate currents, it can slick down that fly to nothing. And it won't have any profile in the water. So you want a bit of a prop, which is what this guy is going to serve as, just to hold those fibers up a little bit and give your fly a little bit of body so that, you know, it doesn't just slick down and disappear into the water. I'm going to do with this, guys. This is a fairly large feather that I plucked from here. This bottom kind of marabou stuff, I'm just going to strip off all that messy stuff. So we've got just those stiffer speckled fibers at the top. And I'm going to tie this in just by the base of the feather here. So we've got that tied in. All I'm going to do now is I kind of like to separate these fibers a little bit before wrapping because they do to kind of stick together otherwise. And we're just going to wrap this real words now. I really don't worry, actually. I, I'm a big fan of nicely folded hackles. This is one case where I'm not. I almost prefer it to be really scruffy and have all the fibers facing every which way uh, because that will aid in that, that sort of prop uh, purpose that we're tying this in for. So... These face every which way, that's fine with me. And getting is pretty forgiving, you can kind of sort it out afterwards. Sorry, my thumbs here, just because it is kind of short and to work with. Once I get to the back, I'm just taking that wire, and I'm wrapping it forward so it crosses through that guinea and kind of binds it down for me. Once I get to the front, I just tie it off. I'll fold the wire back, tie it down again. So, let's wind that wire, break it off. Find my ankle tip somewhere in here and just snip it out. You can see our guinea. That really doesn't look bad, even though it was kind of splayed all over the place as you wrapped it. You can kind of just you know, rough it up and it'll sit nicely for you. Like so. That's a really nice spiky hackle. You can see it's going to prop this marabou up nicely for us. 
this one that we're going to tie, this is purple. Um, colors I like for steelhead flaws around here. Purple, uh, maybe with like splash of pink or orange to set it off, or in this case chartreuse. Uh, black, olive, uh, maybe some browns, maybe an orange or yellow in here, but really purple, black, olive. I think, you know, if you have those covered, you're pretty good. Blue or purple, I'd say, are kind of interchangeable. I tend to not go with, uh, you know, the, the all pink or the all, um, you know, orange is really bright, flashy colors. I don't think really do it for us uh, so much. Maybe on stockfish here and there. If you look at um, the stateside guys, like a lot of the, the Lake Erie tires and those guys, you'll see a lot of really flashy flies. Um, and a lot of that's because they have heavily, heavily stocked fisheries. If you compare two Lake Erie tributaries, uh, you know, say Cataragus Creek is an example, uh, versus Grand River. They're directly across Lake Erie for each other, pretty close to it. One, the Grand has mainly wild fish, apart from some stray stockfish that do come in through Caledonia, versus Cataragus, which is largely stocked. And of course, they have some natural reproduction, but very heavily stocked. And so those stateside guys, you see a lot of flashy, very flashy, colorful flies because they're targeting those stocked fish, uh, which don't have the same natural instincts imprinted in them that a wild fish does, and so they tend to be a little bit more responsive toward the bright stuff that really grabs their attention. For those of you who fish like stock trout ponds, um, you know you know exactly that. You know those fish are really keen to grab colorful stuff, where they may, um, you know, those, those same flies may not work all that well in wild fish. So, uh, you know, cons again, consider where you're fishing. This is a show you the label. This is a select marabou plume. This one's from Wapsi. Um, Bunch of companies make these things. The reason you want the select plume is not the feather length. The first thing you will notice is these are really big feathers. That's actually the fiber length. The fiber length on these is quite long. Uh, you know, you're talking two and a half, three inch sort of uh, fiber length off the sides, and that's again what's going to dictate the size of the fly. Um, and small feathers just really, in my mind, don't look good. We're going to wrap this. This is going to be just sort of a hackle for us. If you look at the stem on these guys, the bottom is just way too thick to have any chance in, uh, in heck of, of wrapping. So what we're going to do is find the point somewhere sort of up here where you think, okay, it's getting too thick, I can't wrap any further. And we're just going to strip off the bottom fluff. You can set this aside, use it for you know bugger tails, things like that if you want, but you just really can't use that in this pattern. So we'll see, we end up with maybe a, a third to a half of the feather left. That's still lots of material. This is a pretty sparse fly. We don't need a lot of this stuff. A lot of people overdo it with marabou on here. All I'm going to do, I want to tie this in by the tip. I'm going to grab it close to the tip as I can. And you'll see as well, I, I chose a feather that has very long fibers, but also very uniform and unbroken fibers. Uh, you will get in these packs occasionally a few bad feathers that just don't uh, do you well. It serves you well, even if you only get a few out of each pack. Choose the best feathers. Uh, this is, again, what really makes the, the whole fly here. What I'm going to do is just find the point we call the sweet spot on a dry fly hack. Well, it's where all the fibers start to be more of a uniform length. So you can see um, down here, they're fairly uniform. As I get up here, they start to shorten up a little bit. So I'm going to grab the feather around here, pull these fibers just down out of the way. So I expose that tip section. Some guys like to wet their hackles. I find it easier to avoid matting this feather if they're dry. Um, but, you know, personal preference. I'm going to tie this in by the tip forward and I pull that tip back, tie it back as well. You could leave that tip in. I doubt anyone would notice. But just to do this by the book, break it off there. And I'm just going to wrap this. Um, it's a little tricky wrapping marabou because it is just so all over the place, um, but it's really not that hard once you get down. Biggest thing, just take your time, make sure that the fibers don't get trapped as you wrap them. Inevitably they will, um, but just take your time, take a wrap off, back up, uh, and correct it as you go. All I do is kind of pull up and back. I like to pull up so that they don't get immediately wrapped underneath the stem. Just really take your time. I'm trying to put these wraps just immediately next to each other, really nice and tight. You don't have a ton of working room here, so 
want to pack these in really well, but you don't want to overlap the stem. See, a lot of people do that. They, they overlap their wraps. They get these, this beautiful flowing marabou going, and they wrap right over top of it and mat all those fibers down. you got to stack these in front of each other so that each fiber can move individually. Is um, saying, I can't remember which guide coined it, but um, it's what an ideal steelhead fly uh, should have characteristic-wise. And um, the saying is motion without movement. Um, steelhead, you know, you're around here at least, we don't have summer land fish. We're talking about, you know, uh, fall through spring when the water is pretty cold and these fish can be fairly lethargic. And, um, you know, you don't want your flies zipping all about. That's why these aren't tied like a lot of trout streamers are, because we're not trying to really invoke a, a um, high-speed chase kind of instinct. Um, but what we want is something very mobile, very lifelike. Um, you know, something that's going to move, uh, it's going to have motion without, you know, darting across the screen, without moving all that much. We want to move this fly fairly slowly, but I have it really flowing and undulating down there, grabbing all their attention. So that's where it comes down to. You really want all these fibers moving very freely. That's a thing you'll, you'll hear come up again and again with these flies. I've gotten those wraps on probably maybe six wraps or so total. This is a great amount of marabou to have. You could go a little denser if you really wanted to for a heavier water version of this fly. Um, but this is about where I like it. I'm going to get a few wraps on there just to make sure it's tied in tightly. I'll just come down and cut off all these fibers as I do it. Snip off the stem. A couple more wraps to sort of tidy up here. Another thing you can do at this point, if you really want, um, is uh, again, this marabou is kind of prone, even with that body hackle underneath, to uh, slicking down and, and heavy ish currents. You can take, if you leave yourself enough room, uh, another guinea feather. If I do this, I usually do two marabou plumes, leave myself a little more room. You could take another guinea feather and actually wrap it in front. What that does is it, it creates, uh, if you think of almost like a pocket in a river, it blocks the current and forces it around the fly. And so it creates a soft pocket behind here where the fibers are free to expand and move as they please. It also creates little micro vortices that, um, that sort of move the fibers for you. Uh, so that can be a good look for, for faster water if you want. You can fish this fly as is, it would fish just fine. Uh, the original called for a uh, few fibers of Amherst. This is just a natural Amherst pheasant. Uh, I don't know if this really adds much to the fly, to be very honest, but it looks good. All I'm going to do here is I'm going to take, uh, I'll start small, so I'll take a couple of fibers to begin with. I think the original called for four clumps of two fibers all around the fly. One there. What I do like about the look about this is uh, just that it adds that little bit of variegation to the fly. One thing that is consistent you see across nature is that very few things are a single color. Usually there's you know, a few things going around, going on in there, you know, some barring or speckling or whatever it may be, whether it be a bug or bait fish or whatever. So having a little break up in the color I think is good. I'm not sure how much it matters when it's this subtle, but why not? So got, yeah, just a few fibers there. These are fairly stiff fibers. You could maybe make the argument that, that if it clings to the marabou at all, it could keep it propped up. I think the guinea does a better job. And again, I could easily leave it here. I've got, this is just a little bit of uh, this is a crinkle flash. I think we have some left at the shop. It's nice stuff. It's, uh, Crinkle flash, this color is called Midnight Fire. You could use any flash to do. They have, I just had this long around ages ago. Sort of a neat mix of some reds and golds and purple and stuff. I'm not going to go super heavy on it, but it's nice to have just a touch. So there's like a four or five strands here. Separated. And you can go just on top if you want. You can kind of spread it out. I'm going to try and sort of dome it across the top. That's just what I like. Stick this hole, it's getting all sticky. Hmm. 
Usually I tie with the orange thread. I decided to do some chartreuse today. I'm not sure if I'm a huge fan. I'll do orange next time. It's going to snip those fibers to the length of the marabou. Um, heavier flash ones, I like to taper them. This is only a few strands of flash. I'm not convinced it makes much difference. That is the fly. A little whip finish on there. A little head cement and a good fish. Uh, again, at this point, you can throw that hook back on safely for you. Um, this is a West Coast pattern. Uh, works very nicely around here again. Though, this, is a, this is a fairly large fly, really, for around here. You could tie this much smaller if you wanted to. I uh, figured a big hook would be easy for everybody to see though today. And this, this hook, this is a, um, uh, it's called a blue heron hook, uh, made by a guy named Dave McNeese. Very popular hook. Uh, we just got a few more in, in the store. Uh, we're about to unbox. They, uh, unfortunately, are not being made anymore. Uh, guys getting out of, um, of selling the things. So what we have is pretty well the last of them, but worth getting your hands on. They're really, really good hook. Uh, there are lots of others that'll do those. It's just you know, any up eye hook will do the job. Um, I'm a big fan of Gamagatsu's. Actually, although I don't tie a lot on mustads, mustad salmon hooks are pretty good. Um, so definitely worth a look there too. This is uh, just a red thread. I lost the label. I'm not sure if this is an eight aught or a ten aught, uh, but something in that range will work well. Probably an eight aught if I had my choice would be to go to. And I'm just going to start the thread up a little bit back from the eye of the hook. Since this is a fairly large hook, you can see the shank is kind of springy, bounces around a little bit as I'm tying. You can just grab the hook and hold it in place if that helps. Smaller hooks don't have that issue. Just going to carry my thread down the shank to just about where the point starts, maybe a little shy of that. And to start this fly, we're going to jump right into the ribs of the fly, which here we got. A flat pearl mylar, just about out on the spool, but this is a just a size 12. Let's see that. There we go. Uh, it's a uni mylar, a size 12. Viva stuff works fine too. Uh, it's just pearl mylar. That's all I need to know. And I'll just go strand here. I'm going to tie this in. The way that you're supposed to tie in ribs on salmon flies, it makes no difference, but technically the way you're supposed to do it, so that's the way we'll do it. It's tied in on the far side of the shank here. Like so, catch in. Mylar is extremely thin stuff, so I'm not concerned about tying it the length of the body or anything. I can just catch it in back there. It won't add any weird bumps to the fly. And then here, this is, um, this is just a small uh, oval um, silver tinsel. This one's Lagerton. This stuff is good. The uni stuff is good. Doesn't really matter. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tie it right next door to this uh, pearl mylar. But I'm going to do it on, uh, if it makes sense to you guys, if this is you know, sort of um, you know, facing, oops. this is lined up vertically. I'm tying this on the bottom of the uh, mylar, but immediately above it. Maybe that's a good argument to, uh, to tie the mylar full length. <laughs> Catch that back in. And the oval tinsel is a little bulkier, so it will add some bulk to this fly. Um, the back half of this fly is going to be a floss body, and anyone who's worked with floss knows that anything that you do underneath shows up in the final product. So I'm going to tie this at least the length of how far my floss is going to reach. Call it about halfway on the hook. I'll line that up just on the very bottom of that tinsel. Just carry my thread up back to that halfway mark. So Making sure that this tinsel stays relatively in line with where it started. That is good. So I don't excess. I haven't bothered to tie it in full length here. It's too long. And then from there, this is an optional step. Um, actually, you know what? We're going to tie my cross first. Keep the order straight here. This is a, a red silk floss you can use. Uh, synthetic stuff too. I don't think it matters a whole lot. Silk does have a really nice sort of glow in the water. Well, I'm just having some that covers up the body. Works well enough for me. You can even use tinsel if you want to for this. It's got a nice long 
strand of floss here. I'll start it in the same spot there and just carry my thread back over the top. Try to keep fairly close touching turns here. You can even flatten your thread in between if you want to keep it really flat. And for me, this would be sort of a, a little bit of a faster water fly. Um, hooks have a surprisingly large amount of weight to them, and they will get down uh, better than you think. Uh, they're just very thin, very dense. Uh, they sink like stones. This fly also, you'll see, uh, has stiffer materials than the last. It'll hold up better to heavier water. This is a silver mylar. Uh, this is the optional step that I mentioned. This is the just like silver and gold stuff that you get from uni. This is a fairly large size, again, just because I want to cover this body quickly. So I'm going to take a little strip of that. I'm just going to tie it in gold side up, gold side facing me. That's just, so I want to start wrapping. The silver side ends up up. Take my thread forward again, roughly touching turns. Doesn't have to be perfect. Push down here. I'm going to take that uh, again to about that halfway mark, and then I'm going to grab my body tackle. Actually, I did this a little bit of order. I tied this on a couple steps ago. But, okay. yeah. and this is just a black schlappen. Uh, so, schlappen, you know, sort of tail feather off a rooster. Uh, very nice, soft fibers, a lot softer than your regular uh, saddle or neck hackle. Um, also, a good bit longer, quite wetty. Uh, and this stuff makes a really nice spay hackle. There's um, a lot of traditional spay flies, uh, you know, your, your British uh, classic spay flies were tied with um, um, uh, a cock hackle, or sorry, a spay cock, um, which um, fortunately the bird isn't around anymore, but this is a very close substitute in terms of its consistency. Um, uh, yeah, it really ties nicely. We're going to tie this in by the base of the feather. So opposite that you would by uh, any you know, fly like a, a woolly bugger. Um, and that's just because you've got the longest fibers at the base here, and we want these out the back here to give us some length to this fly, so this fly actually ends back around here. If we tie it in by the tip, you know how a woolly bugger is very short, sort of teardrop shape, it would just be a little stubby and uh, wouldn't quite have the same flow. So we're gonna tie in by the base. Uh, do strip off enough fibers though that you're on a nice uh, flexible part of the stem though that you can actually hack it because these do get a little thick down toward the bottom just like the marabou did. I'm going to get to a comfortable spot here and I'm just going to line this up. If you imagine, this is getting a little tricky, but if you, imagine, if you see this pearl tinsel we had up top, we had our oval tinsel just below it, so pearl and our oval, we're going to have our hackle tied in below it. So all of these right next to each other, uh, right abutting next to each other, um, but that's the order that you want to stack them. And I'm going to place this feather so that those fibers start right at the back of the fly, right where I tied everything else in. And I'm just looking to cover the stem and no fibers as I tie this in. But kind of line it up there. If anything, I might want to even have a little bit of exposed stem at the back here. So, yeah, if, um, if the body ends right here, the fibers actually start on the stem just a couple of millimeters back. And the reason for that is that it'll give me just a little bit of wiggle room uh, that I can orient this feather as I want um, and won't start sticking the fibers out right away. So I can kind of tweak it to get it to lay the way I want when I start palmering this hackle. Um, just makes things a little more forgiving. Just going to tie it down. Length of this shank, try to keep it nice and straight as well. This is one of those flies that, you know, uh, I'll put it this way, not many guides would fish because it takes way too long to tie. Uh, if you like tying, this is a really fun fly to tie. If, uh, if you don't, then tie that hobo spay and maybe a couple of zonkers and uh, get you fishing way quicker <laughs> and you won't cry as much when you lose one.
but they are very fast by this time. This is called a Mahoney. And this fly was created by Deck Hogan. It follows sort of the same, um, you know, anatomy as a lot of feather wing spay flies, like the ones from Sig Lasso out west uh, and others. But um, yeah, it's a Mahoney. It's a very well established fly. Catches lots of fish. It's got a nice fishy color combo. Um, I think what I'm going to do here. So I've got the hackle tied in. I'm going to take that silver and gold tinsel. And I'm going to start wrapping it forward. And when you're wrapping mylar, especially when you're putting silk over it, you want a really nice, firm, smooth base for that, uh, that silk to go over top of. I'm going to pull down fairly tightly so that this really hugs the body. And you don't get those little, um, you know, when, you, when it overlaps, you get raised edges on the sides of this. I want this to be just slick right against the body. Take that to about the halfway mark here, just as long as our floss is going to go. And just tie that off. <laughs> I realize that tinsel's pretty blinding to you guys. Watching the light there. I'll be covered up in a sec. From there, we're going to grab our red floss. And we're just going to cover up all of that silver. And the reason we do this is that um, silky is a natural fiber, and it does tend to sort of darken and bleed a little bit um, you know, in the water, and you'll lose a lot of that color. By having the silver underneath, it really uh, makes this stuff glow and gets it to show much closer to its true color in the water. You want to be really finicky about your floss. You should be very careful not to do what I've done and store it with a pile of all my threads so it gets all frayed. But yeah, proficient fly. This will work fine. I'll take that to about the halfway mark. Just tie it off. And now, I mean, this looks just the same as it would if I didn't do that in between step of the silver tinsel uh, dry. But when wet, it'll have a lot more color to it. It'll really show through a lot better. For the forward half of this body, it's going to be a dubbed body, and we're going to use a seal fur for it. So, I mean, there's other. Um, and materials you could definitely use here. You could use that STS for it. You could even do a full silk body if you want. This, the seal fur is just nice and prickly. has a really nice translucency. It kind of glows itself. Um, it's got a really nice look. You can dub this straight on. What I like to do a lot of the time is uh, I form a quick little dubbing loop up here. Uh, what I like to do with the dubbing loop is well, by no means invented this. But when you tie a dubbing loop, you are familiar. I'm assuming that people are more with these things. All you do is you double over your thread and you start tying back down over top of it so as to seal a loop of thread in there. And then what you want to do, I think at least, is just twist that loop around your thread a couple of times, put another wrap or two of thread down over top. What that does is it really makes sure that the starting point for this loop is in exactly the same point. It really pinches it in there. So when you put fibers into this loop, they're really tightly packed in there. Otherwise, if you have two, two different starting points for this loop, things can get loose in there and, and slip on you. So I've got that loop in there. I'll just let it hang out there, and I'm just going to bring my thread up to the eye. From here, I like to, I just, some guys use a bobbin cradle. I just lengthen my thread and sat down on the desk so it doesn't move around on me. I'm going to grab, this is a dubbing loop twister. This is the OPST one. This is a really simply designed one, but frankly, is my favorite. Uh, it's just really heavy, uh, and so when you put it down on a loop, it just, get the loop in there, it just really pinches it down uh, and really pulls those fibers tight in between it. There are other fancier ones you can get, but this thing just does the job really, really well. You can use wax in these loops. You don't have to, although I do find that it, it helps things stick. This is just plain old dubbing wax, the nice, soft, sticky stuff. I'm just going to dab a little bit onto the thread there, and that's just going to help those fibers really stick in there well. I'm going to take a bit of that seal for now. Don't need a ton, but you know, a nice little pinch. And I'm just going to try and, I like to like, sort of hold the clump all together and pull fibers off the side. By doing that, I sort of line them up so I can feed them into this loop better. I'm not going to have as many uh, loose fibers. So I'll take a small pinch. Put it in there. Let's do that more times here. Yeah. 
see with that dubbing wax, I can open and close this loop. The fibers stay fairly well tacked in there, not really sliding around. You will lose some fibers on this stuff after you tie it in. So it can be a good idea to put on a little more than you need, just knowing that's going to thin out. Don't go crazy with it though. I'd rather have this a little too sparse than too thick. All I'm gonna do from here, I can see it's all pinched in that loop. I'm just gonna take my uh, dubbing twister here. I'm gonna pinch the loop just below my material so if this doesn't start spinning right away. I'm just gonna give that a good spin. And once it's really well twisted up, see it's actually raised up how many twists I had in there. I'm gonna release this loop. Let those materials spin in between, and I'm just going to give it a little touch up, a little extra. And before wrapping this on, this is basically become a chenille now. It's a big dubbing rope, very spiky fiber. You can see it's, it's a little looser than if I dubbed it on straight to my thread. Uh, so it's not so thick, because you can see the core of, oh, maybe you can't. You can kind of see, yeah. The core of this is quite thick. If I start wrapping this, it's going to bulk up really quickly. I want to almost be able to see my thread. I want a line going down the middle of this thing as thin as just my two strands of thread up top here, so that when I start wrapping, it doesn't add excess bulk, and I just have those exposed fibers. So I've got a little dubbing brush here, I'm just going to touch things up a little bit. And this will just pull out any matted down fibers, it'll really free everything up, get those fibers, again, separated, and kind of moving on their own, and final fly once it's wet. And you can be, well, don't, don't be gentle with this, be kind of rough with it, Really put it through the ringer, and then you know that any fibers that made it through that are going to stay there. If you know you're too gentle with it, you might get a false sense of what that fly is going to look like in the, the final product. Um, so yeah, really go at it, pick those fibers out, and then you're confident that they're going to stay put there. From here, you can start wrapping. This is a little awkward to wrap the whole thing itself, so you can use the rotary function in your vise if you want, or you can just wrap it. Either way works. Let's start. And I'm just going to cover the rest of my shank with this. You'll see I'm not packing it really tightly. I'm holding this at a bit of an angle. I'm just kind of spiraling this up. I want the fibers themselves to kind of cover the shank. I don't need every you know, a millimeter of shank there covered in seal fur. Uh, I just want the end product to kind of veil the hook so you can't tell if there are any bare spots in between. But less is more of the stuff. As I say, this is a very translucent fiber. I'm just gonna tie this off here. Sorry. Um, it's very translucent fiber. And so you want to take advantage of that translucency. If you just pile material on, it becomes just opaque and dead like everything else. Um, so now leave it fairly sparse. And you can even pick that a little further, make sure there are no more trap fibers under what you just wrapped. So you'll notice I've left. A fair bit of room up front here, probably again three or four millimeters of space. Worst thing you can do on one of these flies is crowd the eye and uh, not be able to tie it on your line. So, and I have a few more materials to go here, so I'm leaving a good bit of room up front. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take my main body rib, and that's my uh, my pearl tinsel here. I'm going to start wrapping it up the fly. Be careful to wrap this fairly tightly, especially over the floss, because it will slip otherwise on you. I'm going to shoot for about five ribs. Five is general rule of thumb for salmon flies. Um, no real reason. You could go more or go less. It wouldn't really affect things all that much. Uh, this just, it's a nice balanced look to the fly if you go for five. It's a really big hook and maybe a really small hook. Maybe adjust one or two wraps here. Then. Five wraps. Try and make sure they're pretty evenly spaced. I like to do this by hand, not using the rotary function of the vise. I find I get a little bit better control. Tie that down a few tight wraps there. And you can see I've trapped a few fibers in my seal here, so I, at, one, at some point I will pick those back out. Um, make sure those again are, are free and, and free to move as they please. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take my small uh, oval silver tinsel here. I'm going to start wrapping it. If you lined this up correctly, as you wrap it, you should be able to follow the same kind of angle that you did with the pearl tinsel and have that lie immediately behind the pearl tinsel. And there is a reason for this. I'll show you in a sec exactly why that is. I mean, it's not the end of the world if you don't, but these things have all, well, some of them, I, I would not blindly say that all fly time techniques have reason behind them, but some do. 
This I think is one. So I'm, I've just wrapped that immediately uh, following the, the pearl tinsel, immediately trailing it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for my body pack. And uh, I'm going to start wrapping this up. And again, it's tied directly below those two ribbing materials. So it should, when we start wrapping this, trail immediately behind both of those ribs. And I mentioned there's a reason for wrapping the uh, oval tinsel behind the flat pearl. And that is, when we start wrapping this, we're going to tuck the uh, hackle stem in behind that uh, oval tinsel. And the reason for that is if a fish's teeth start digging into this fly a little bit, they have the potential to nick a hackle stem along the way and you know, cause, cause this fly to kind of spring apart. So by tucking the hackle stem behind, especially when it gets to the thinner part up front, behind the oval, it sort of protects it slightly from the fish's tooth, getting where it shouldn't be. So I'm taking my time, just really pulling it in tight behind each oval wrap, and sometimes you know, it takes a couple tries to really get stick there, but that's a roll. I'm just kind of pulling these hackle fibers back as I go. And yeah, I'm just checking, make sure, making sure on each side that it's in about where it wants. One's not perfect. And then that stem is ready to go. This is one of those things where, yeah, it's a little annoying in the moment to tie, but you're spending, well, this is probably a good 20 minute fly. You're spending 20 minutes on a fly, you might as well get to where you want it to be and not be disappointed with the product afterwards. So bring it right up. Lost my thread off. I'm not making really any extra turns at the front. I don't want this to get too heavy. If you go too heavy on the hackle on these things, what will happen is, um, frankly, the fibers won't be able to move. They'll all kind of blob up together, and they won't have space to move freely. So with all steelhead flies, again, so I keep coming back to it, you want to create space within the fly that allows the fibers to open up, move as they please, get that real sort of breathing effect it won't face stream or any wet fly, really. You know, think of a, you know, a sort of classic spider, like wet fly pattern you use trout. Very sparse. You, know, you, you get that hackle standing up nice and high, but it's sparse without a lot of materials that are going to cause the fly to get gummed up and not be able to move. You want it to be able to breathe. So same kind of thing I've gone on here, just a little heavy. That's a body. And then, actually, two more hackles. We're going on here. This is a uh, <laughs> these a long time ago from uh, some craft supplies, uh, but um, it's kind of a cool slap. And the original was a, a red slap, and um, this is sort of just like a, a black with red tips, which is kind of neat. But uh, I doubt you'll ever find these things. Uh, I've never seen them since. Red slapping works very nicely. I'm just going to strip off some of the bottom fibers from one of these. And uh, I don't want much. I only want maybe a wrap, maybe, maybe two. I'll leave myself enough room here for two wraps. That's about right. I'm just going to pull that down from the tip, tie that in. I'm being really careful at this point to sort of minimize thread wraps where I can um, because this will bulk up quickly if I'm not careful. And for the wing, we really need a nice flat tie-in base, uh, ideally. Otherwise, the wing can kind of get jostled. So I'm trying to really make a conscious effort to keep nice tight wraps here and use a minimum amount if possible. This stem, I will say, though, is fairly slippery. And so what I'll do is I made three wraps there. I'm going to make some of the four. And now this thing is in there. It's not going to slip. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this hand clips back. Like so, just pull this fibers back. And I'm going to make... A turn, so that works. Yeah, maybe two. This is a big fly, so I'm going to go with two turns. The manning fibers is off. Yeah, I like how that looks. Now, again, I don't want to use an excessive amount of turns of thread. I made, what, seven wraps of thread there. I would say that's very excessive. I would say three is good for the initial time. So I'm going to back one, two, three, and four and then I'm going to tie it off again. So you can use thread wraps as sort of placeholders materials and take them off afterwards if you don't need that much grip in the final product. That looks very nicely balanced to me. Just going to come in, 
snip off, I have a tip, stem, and my thread. That's nice. Hold up, fix that. Let's go through that again quickly. You need to fret when that happens. I don't think I've ever given a tying presentation, definitely not to you guys, without breaking my thread or tying my thread once. It's amazing. All right, not sure if I lost my computer's gone to gone to sleep a couple times here. All right, do that again once more very quickly. I'm not gonna bother stripping anything at this time. Let's do that. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not going anywhere. That I'll strip off the extra adders here. So, two, three, four. I'll tie that off. There we go. Looks good to me. And ideally, uh, portion wise, I'm looking for, um, again, probably like initial fiber length to be similar to body length. I have to use my scissors calipers sometimes. So, those fibers coming off the back, first couple turns, are about the same as the body. And uh, the fibers from the schlap and the wrap the collar here, this red stuff, should come down to about the point of the hook. That's kind of what we're looking for. For the collar here. This is, uh, again, guinea, as I say. It pops up a lot in the time in these things. This one's purple, uh, obviously. And we're just going to grab a fairly large feather here. I look for something, in this case, with a pretty thin stem that I can easily wrap in a tight space like this. Last fall, I wasn't as concerned. I'm going to strip off again all the fluff from the bottom. And uh, in this case, I, I'm actually good just using one side of the feather. Uh, and so, should I get this right? Yeah. If you're facing the convex side of the feather, which I'm facing towards you guys now, not this side, but this side here, uh, meaning the fibers are slipping away from you, then I'm going to strip off, if you're facing it that way, the left side of the feather here. This whole side here, just going to strip off, that's my left. Left side of the feather. From there, pull down those fibers off the side, those longer fibers. Tie it in by the tip. As I said, this is a very stiff fiber. So it does really allow those fibers behind it to open up and move. But if you overdo it, you can kind of kill the action of the fly too uh, by introducing too many stiff fibers to this thing. So I've got half of it just facing back. I don't have to fold it at all in this case. It's quite nice to work with. I just start wrapping. And they're going to lay back very nicely for me. You know, I'm packing all these fibers in a really tight space. Trying to get all these wraps edge to edge. So I'm really conserving space at the front. Again, this is a large fly, so I think two wraps is good. A couple fibers there. Down there. A little splash of purple in there, I think it looks great. Get back off a couple wraps of thread again. Just lash that right in. Come in. One. Got two. Those are that's our entire body now with the collar and everything. And even that again, that'd be a great fish and fly. But we're gonna add a wing to it. So this is a hackle tip wing. See a lot of these, these are more classic kind of uh, West Coast spade flies. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple small feathers. This is just a, a regular rooster neck here, dyed black. And you want to try and find one with nice even sides. You can see how I've, I've got a nice curve on each side of the feather, or each side of the cape here, uh, sort of complementary curves. Sometimes you'll get them that are really twisted. They all curve one way or another. 
Uh, you want to try and find ones where they're nice and even on both sides. And I'm looking for a feather. It'll end up being somewhere sort of in the middle down here. I'm looking for a feather. I'm looking for four feathers, actually. And ideally, something with a fairly nice rounded tip is really the ideal. But again, I don't fish care. What's more important is that you do use the proper neck hackle for this. If you don't use neck hackles, if you use saddles, the stems are going to be really thin on them, and it's going to be next to impossible to get them to sit right. Just because they're going to roll on you. So I've taken two feathers in a similar spot on either side of that neck. And I'll put that background for you again. If you can, there we go. If you can see, eh, it doesn't really show it all well, a bit of an angle. But they each curve sort of inwards like this. So I've got two from one side, two from the other. I'm going to take it's just one from either side to start with. I'm going to pair them up like so, so they're back to back. I've got two feathers in my hand here, all backwards. There we go, back to back. I'm going to set those, and they're paired up so they each curve the same way. I'm going to set those on top of the fly, and I like a long wing on mine. Uh, technically, I think the wing's supposed to be maybe a, as long as the point of the hooks, just somewhere up here. I like something that reaches back a little further, maybe toward the bend almost. That just gives the fly a little more motion in my mind. I don't think there's any downside to it, uh, so that's where I like to see it. Now, as I mentioned, it's really important that we keep a nice flat tie-in point uh, at the front of the hook here. If we try and tie it in here, because of all these hackles I've built up, the wing will tend to stick right up because it'll be pushed up on angle by the, the hackles behind it. So what I want to do is try and level this off so that I can get a nice low set wing. That's the sign of a really well tied feather wing, something that's going to, with a wing that's going to hug the body really nicely for you. So what I'm going to do is I've got, I'm going to put it here, here we go, just a little bit of tying wax here. Suggest like your white tying wax. I just want to take up a small piece here. Warm up my fingers a little bit. I'm going to wax up our thread. This will just give our, our thread a lot more grip. This is not dubbing wax, this is white tires wax. It's different, it's a, it's a very hard wax. I don't know if you could hear it on the thread there, um, but it, it's a very hard wax which gives it really firm grip. And so I can build up my wraps in one single spot. I can, uh, without having my wraps slide forward or back, build them almost straight upwards and get it to the, the height that I want it here. Just got my wax thread there, wax a little more. So I'm just sticking those wraps all in the same spot. I'm just building, I'm trying not to go over my purple hackle here, but I'm just building my thread base up so it's about the same level as that, um, that hackle behind it. So I'm go back, grab my hackles. I'm using them for my wing. And then I'm just going to measure them out be about as long as the entirety of the hook. And I'm just going to strip off the fibers from the base. So my tie-in point is a bare stem down here. Slip that stem a little shorter. Okay. I'm going to set these on top. Just a loose wrap over top. Kind of see how they're sitting. And then you know, pull down these hackle fibers so you can see. There's my wing up top there. So you can see it's a fairly low set. I could do with that being a little lower. I wouldn't mind if it was a little lower. But it's a fairly low set. And that's all thanks to that little bit of prep work. Just increasing the uh, diameter of my head slightly. Kind of sloping things off so it's not such an abrupt angle. Oh, that's a nice low set right there. That's pretty good. Um, to get those hackle stems laying side by side and not crossing they will want to twist on you more often than not because remember they're curving into each other so they want to cross over top get them to lay side by side and you won't 
have a wing that uh, twists as much on you. So just keep an eye on that. And make sure it don't twist. It'll be very easy to set once you figure that out. What is nice about that fly is that those fibers don't really hold a lot of water. And it's a very easy fly to cast as long as you stick to reasonable sizes. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll cast very, very easily for you and pick out of the water very nicely too. The final one we're going to do tonight is a little tube. I fish a lot of tubes. I frankly probably fish more tubes uh, than shanks or single hooks. They're just a really versatile platform and they fish exceptionally well. They are much lighter, or they can be depending on how you tie them, than either the single hooks or the shanks. And that's really nice, I think, because a weightless fly has a lot more motion in the water. It really lets the current take it and move it as it will. Um, and they, they just look alive in the water. I really like that. And obviously because they're light, they're easy to cast too. So you will need a little adapter, um, if, assuming you don't have a, an actual tube fly vise. Uh, for this, adapters are fairly inexpensive, you know, 10, 15 bucks or so. Um, they just fit into the jaws of your vise. And it's just a, basically a tapered needle usually. And they just allow you to hold these tubes more effectively. So this is a... I'll show you the package here. This is that package doesn't really exist anymore. And this is a Pro Tube Micro Tube is the uh, product name. There are lots of different tubes out there that you can use. Uh, all you do, no matter what tube you're tying on, is you just slide it right on to this tapered needle, push it up a little ways so it doesn't spin on you, and then you tie on it like you would any other hook or shank, whatever it may be. Uh, people get intimidated over these things. They are very easy to work with. This is a sort of a wine colored thread. Um, mix it up, use whatever you like. Again, in an ADOT, you know, in the Beavis, that's why I really like. Now, the great thing about tubes is that the size that you tie them on is, is variable. You can adjust it to whatever size you want, no matter what the starting length the tube is that you have. You can just click this tube. This is just plastic to whatever length you like. Um, in this case, you know, we're going to use the majority of the length of this body. I'm just going to start my thread a little ways back from front here. I'm just going to take my thread down over the tube. Again, there's no difference really tying on a tube versus anything else other than uh, the circumference, obviously, the tying surface is quite a bit larger than a hook shank. So you have to account for that if you're wrapping materials, it'll eat up more material. Um, that's something you just kind of get used to over time. That's really the only difference to keep in mind. Now, for our first stage here, we're going to jump right into one of those fancy doubling loops. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a small loop of thread here, wrap over it, and twist it around my thread a couple times. I'm just going to bring the thread up and out of the way. Grab my dubbing twister again. Just put the hook. Open up the stick, get all twisted. So, put the hook through the loop there. Just let that hang out. I take a little dubbing wax again and just tack up this thread very slightly. It doesn't take much. And we're going to use some purple ice dub here. You can mix up the colors as you like. Purple's always a favorite of mine. I really like purples and blacks and blues just because I think they fish equally as well in high water or clear water. Um, they're fairly natural tones. They don't put off fish, I don't think, in uh, even fairly clear water. So I'm, I'm just always confident fishing them. Um, yeah, this fly is fairly flashy. So this one would be reserved more as a high water fly, a high-ish water fly. I've got a little clump of ice up here. All I've done is, again, so pulled it apart and stacked it in my fingers. The fibers are more or less lined up here. They're all going to sit perpendicular to that thread, and I'll be caught in that loop. A decent sized clump in there. Careful not to overdo it. Just going to give that a twist. And again, grab that uh, brush. All oh, gummed up other fibers. And just pluck those fibers out. Again, you lose a bunch of fibers, so they're a little heavier than lighter. And in doubt. Uh, and I'm just going to now with all these fibers freed up. Start wrapping right at the very back of this tube. Pulling the fibers back as I go. Okay. 
there. Bring this thing back into play. Cross off that loop. Cut the access off. And then again, it's coming with the brush. It's going to free up this fire. It's getting splayed out like so. And on top of that, server base. This is an intruder that we're tying. Variation on one. There's tons of different intruders out there. And saying you're fishing an intruder is kind of like saying you're fishing a mint. There are tons out there. It's just a style of fly. But the idea behind intruders is they uh, they offer you a large profile, so they're good for higher water, um, but with a minimal amount of stuff on them. So they, they're a, sort of a hollow tide fly, uh, and because of that, they're easy to pick up, easy easy enough to cast at least. Generally, they're larger flies, so I'm not going to say they're extremely easy, but easy enough to cast, and they offer you a big profile, and they get noticed. What we're going to do is we're going to, you'll see, we'll build this in stages. We've got here, this is a product called Shimmer Fringe. This is really cool stuff. If you've worked with ice, uh, sorry, not ice, uh, ice dub, uh, angel hair before, very similar. It's kind of like an angel hair, but it's on a sheet at the top here, so it's all lined up nicely for you. You can just take fibers off and all ready to go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make another quick little dub in the loop here. And you can make this more complicated by using something called a composite loop. A composite loop is basically a dubbing loop with multiple materials in it. And they're great, they work very well, um, but they are a little more challenging to tie and to get the density right and everything on. And so just to keep it simple, we're going to do separate dubbing loops here. And you'll see it works just fine. Um, I'm going to take a hank of fiber here. Not a huge bunch, but you know, a bit. I'm going to eyeball, that's a little longer than my wall. I'm going to use about half the length of this. That's maybe just... That's actually not bad, but maybe a tad longer than I want it. Let's trim it down just slightly. Let's look down to set my twister here before getting into this. Do that now. Time to put a little bit of wax on there. Speed that into the loop. See it's all clumped up now, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to spread it out a little bit here. Like so, give that a little twist. Grab our brush here, and just go to town on that. Don't worry about losing a few fibers, you know you will. Make sure that's going to hold up when you start fishing it. This will wet it a little bit, just pull those fibers back. So it's sort of like a hackle. I'll wrap those um, immediately in front of the ice dub is the important thing here. The ice dub is serving as a little bit of a prop to stand these fibers up for us. If you don't wrap it right up against the ice dub, it loses that effect because you're trying to achieve an angle with these fibers, prop them up, get some body to this fly. If you advance your thread forward, you can get a really shallow angle with the fibers, and you will, and it sort of defeats the purpose. That in. I've got longer fibers back there, a little bit more body to the fly. In front of that, I'm going to do another very quick little loop here. Again, you could do this all in one go, but just to keep it simple, keep them separate. Uh, again, so I'll hook here. And here, I'm going to use some flashaboo. I've got a couple packs here. I've got sort of a, a lavender colored flashaboo. This is a technique called fuchsia and a holographic flashaboo. You can mix up any colors you like. Uh, just, I like a couple. Mix up the colors again. Nothing is really you know, single color in nature. I'm just going to take both colors, sort of lay them together, and put a little twist, sort of blend them up all these fibers mixed together. And I'm actually going to come in, I'm going to fold them over, like so. I'm going to cut them in half. So I've doubled up the clump, shortened it considerably, obviously. A couple of stragglers 
hold them out, make sure these are sort of nicely lined up. And what I'll do here is I'll, I'll stagger the fibers a little bit, so pinching the clumps somewhere around the middle. I'll just tease out a few fibers from one side of the clump, just to stagger them and give it kind of a natural taper. And now I'm going to put these inside that same loop. Just like we did the last one, these fibers can be too long and you have to sort of trim them down a little bit more. That's fun. It's a little messy. Working kind of flash on loop isn't the easiest prospect. But spin it up. I'm actually going to use my scissors in this case just because I can get under the matted down loops of flash here. I can just tease it out a little bit. And you can see well, it's not that bad to work with. Let me just tease them right back out. Spread up a little bit more. And so usually, um, you see a lot of intruders tied with uh, this stuff, which is rhea. It's kind of like a thin ostrich. Or you'll see ostrich, like uh, these guys used for it. This is just another way you can go, another fiber you can use to put a twist on these things. There's another great uh, intruder fly called a squid row. Uh, that actually uses rubber legs at this stage. That gives a ton of motion to a fly. Lots of different fibers you can use. But these are sort of, I think from as feelers to the fly, these sort of trail back beyond the other fibers. And you're using the fibers underneath to, again, kind of prop these up a little bit. Get them splayed out, get them really moving, dancing in the current. Give yourself some body to the fly. Strap that like a hackle. And tie that off. And the reason we use a dubbing loop instead of just tying those in and then folding them back, you can do that too. I think that works actually perfectly fine with the ostrich and the rhea. Um, but in this case, they would just be very flat. By putting it inside the dubbing loop, it actually gets the uh, fibers to stick out perpendicular from the thread. And so that means upwards and out from the fly. And again, just creates that angle, creates a little bit of body to the fly. But I record a little bit here. Again, these fibers are a little longer than I really wanted them, at least at their extremes. So I'm just going to pull this up, just going to shorten a bit of this stuff. I'm not trying to cut it square, just sort of taper it off. We would call this a station on an intruder. Basically, an intruder is usually two parts. It's a back station, and we have a bare body, essentially, and a second one of these at the front. And that, you know, joined together creates that hollow kind of profile and gives you the body. So back station, usually, you don't want to tie it ridiculously long, otherwise you end up with a massive fly. Now, if it's a little slim, like, that's fine. I'd rather have a big, bulky front that's going to sort of teardrop and taper out toward the back. I'll give you a nice sort of tape. So that's our back. It's pretty straightforward. What I sometimes like to do is I'll even put a little bit of schlapping in front of this just to tidy things up. I'm not going to bother here. I think that looks just fine. For the body, this is just a holographic silver tinsel from uh, Vivas. This is a large pearl we look good on here. You can even leave the body bare. I don't think it would make a difference. And again, I don't doubt it, marabou uh, or rabbit, for that matter, on a hook catches a lot of fish. So you do not need to put in this much effort, but feels good. And we've got a long winter coming up, so it helps fill the days. Got that. Uh, sometimes I'll put on a little bit of just regular silver wire to help really lock things in. So and I'm just going to sort of build this body up slightly. You can kind of see how it's kind of ramped. There's a bit of a larger back 
butt section where I tied down those materials to level us off a little bit with my since I'm even base to sit on. Doesn't take a lot. Take my tinsel. It's not a bad idea even at this point. If you don't want to use the wire, put down a little bit of super glue at this point. Just tack this tinsel down, keep it from moving. So obviously, as the name would imply, I think I called it a flash intruder in the description for tonight. Um, this is not a subtle fly. This is a high water fly for me, or this is like a you know, state side. Or, say a Saugeen River does have a lot of stock fish, so a lot of times these brighter colors do work well out there. I don't fish this every day, but it is nice when you need it. Let's take that wire over there as well, just to really hold down that tinsel. Make sure it doesn't shift around on me. Let's get that stuff for sure. Especially if you super glue that thing. So I've got my back station done, and as I say, it's basically just a repeat from here on in with a couple little tweaks. I'm going to add a couple materials. One of which I think is fairly important is uh, these are just some small lead eyes. This is actually these are really small. These are mini, mini size. This is a really small set of dumbbells. I am not looking um, to create a really heavy fly with this. I don't want this thing to be way, way down in the water column. All I want with this is to heal the fly. The issue with this fly, if you don't put anything on it, is that it's symmetrical. It's what we say is tied in the round uh, on all sides. And so if you aren't careful, if you aren't using a big enough hook, especially in bigger and heavier currents, it can roll on you, twist up your leader pretty well. Fish may not care because it's just going to look even all the way around, but it can kind of script the leader and not be great. So a uh, little tiny pair of dumbbells, just enough to sort of keep this fly straight in the water. Just tie it down the bottom. And the great thing about a tube is because of how big the diameter of the tube is, um, dumbbells are really easy to tie without them twisting on you. So just kind of cross wraps here. I'll just make a few figure eights around each side. So we'll pull them back. Pretty well on there. Just just enough to kill the fly. At this point, we're just, again, basically going to do a repeat. So I'm going to, I a little loop here. I can show you, actually. In this case, I showed you one way of doing it with a multiple double loop. I'll show you the composite loop way here. So all I'm going to do, loops, spinners, I'm good to go here. Take that same purple ice stub. Take pinch. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of line it up here, same as I would getting it ready for the dubbing loop. But now I'm going to just clear up a little space on my bench here, and unfortunately you won't be able to see this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay this down flat on my table. Okay, so now I've just got a straight line dubbing in front of me. Maybe, actually, you know what, here we go. Get this out of the way. So I've got on my table a little bunch of dubbing. And now what I'm going to do is take that same shimmer fringe and stuff, take a little clump of it, then a little goes a long way, especially when you're talking about flash. But the idea here is really to keep sparse profiles. We're not going crazy with this stuff. Take this, and in this case, I, my front station obviously has to veil the entire fly, so I don't, mind, I don't need to trim this down this time. I'm going to leave it the whole length. Put it down on my ice stub. Now I'm going to do, I'm going to take a little more ice stub and I'm going to put it down on top. I'm just sort of sandwich this in here. And by doing that, ice stub is very clingy stuff and it, it's almost like Velcro. It'll Velcro to itself and it'll Velcro to the material you put in between it. And so now what I can actually do, I will pick up the entire thing, entire bundle. That's kind of stuck together. You can see it's actually kind of hard to mess this. Uh, I'm gonna really try. I've got the entire bundle in my hand now. Let's hold this back up so you can see the vice. Back in frame here. And I'll put this entire thing. It's kind of twisted while we're doing that. Into our loop. That's our bottom. And I'm going to do 
rest that flash again, bring it down here. Just a little bit of our purple flash do flash. Things together. So I have two little clumps of flash beer there. I'll roll them between my fingers, get them all mixed up. Nice dispersion of each color on the fly. I'll sort of tease those ends out. Just a tad. That's really long. Let's come out. Let's go here. Just going to feed in these fibers in the same loop. Just below the rest of them. And mess that up a little bit. A little bit. All right. Spread those out. And give it all a twist. Hope for the best. Looks like a complete mess, but it works. Come back with our cutting brush here. All the back twist that came out a little too easy. You want to sort of intermittently pick out. You don't want to go for one giant twist and then try and pick everything out because they'll be wrap, wrapped in uh, way too tightly um, to, uh, to hope they will just pick things out. They might have gotten trapped along the way there. So. Twist it, pick, twist it, pick. There we go. Now we've got the whole deal in just one go. I don't know if that was actually quicker or not. I feel like that was a little slower, actually. But it does work. And the nice thing about this is that it actually will, I think, result in a little bit more overall body to the fly. Uh, because you're intertwining the, you know, the prop dubbing uh, and the shimmer fringe or angel hair with all the, you know, they're all in the same bundle. And so they all kind of help each other and lift the whole package up. So I think you do get a little more body to this thing. Turn them down a little bit. Brush them out just a bit. And now, even though this is a flash based intruder, this is a little much for my liking. So I like to tone this down just slightly, and I do that with some black marabou. So all I do, take plan. This is that uh, select marabou again. I'm just going to take boom, just like we did the other hobo spay. Make sure I get this one down. Tie it in again. A little ways down the feather. Catch it in by the tip. Pull that back. Wrap that a couple times in front. I want to keep this fly fairly light and airy. This just helps, I think, tone down the, the overall now flash just slightly. And offer a little more contrast. I think it almost makes the flash pop in some ways more because it's now contrasting against that black. Otherwise, it just looks like this big blowing ball in the water. Tie that off. Snip that. So, and what we'll do even from there is put a couple turns of slapping in front. So then just black, nothing fancy. Just 
I like about the dumbbells as well is that they're a nice stopping point. One thing about tubes that uh, seems to get a lot of people, myself included, is that the head can run away on you because you don't have a defined stop point for the fly. By adding the eyes, you do sort of have that defined stop point. It's hard to overshoot and just keep the material behind the eyes. And, uh, it's a nice visualization as well as a physical obstacle to get around. So it's good for that. All right, there we go. This adds just a little bit of bulk to the fly, like that guinea collar on the last one. You know, Chris, I'm not sure whether that schlappin' feather is a necessity or you just like saying schlappin'. It is a fun word. It is a really fun word there, but just... Older came up with a, a great greeting at the shop, actually, which is, uh, what's schlappin'? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's about it. I'm just going to clean up a little bit here, cover up loose ends, my thread, just because I don't like loose ends. Again, that's meant that. Just gonna pull this off quickly here. Off the needle. And to finish it up, just gonna take a lighter and shall say. You wanna cut this tube at this point so it's just about I'd say a millimeter shorter than the finishing point for the thread. Open up a little bit there. And then take your lighter. Don't put it right in the flame, but hold it up near, don't blow it out either. Hold it up near the edge of that tube, just until it starts, you'll see it'll sort of start, I don't think you can see it on the camera well there, but it'll start mushrooming back, it'll peel back, and that uh, keeps the thread from slipping over the front of the fly. That'll make a, a nice clean stop point. From there, you know, just take a look, make sure that the hole's actually open. You probably can't see it with the lighting here. But, uh, Make sure that there is actually a hole that passes right through the fly. If not, take a bodkin or something and poke it out. And if you aren't familiar with the tubes, just to go through it, the way you attach these to your line, you want to peel all the materials back. These little microtubes, they have that little stopper back there. That's what I tied everything in front of. So I leave a, a little bit of bare tube back there. And what we do with that bare tube, there we go. These somehow got a little discolored on, maybe start as clear. But uh, these are little silicone hook keepers. We call it junction tubing. Uh, this one's from, again, Pro Sport Fisher. These are called, uh, they call them hook guides. And they're just these little uh, bits of silicone tubing. Sort of tapered. And what you do, take the bigger end of that, and you just push it right over top of the silicone on the back of your tube. So I've got this little silicone tail to your fly. From here, I'm going to have my line handy. Got some crazy heavy scale. Got some 20 pound, that'll work. What you do, small tip it. Just take your, your leader line and you got to thread it through the front of the tube. These things are intimidating to a lot of people, but they're actually crazy easy to set. Put your line through the front, pull it out the back. And we're going to use those same hooks that we used for the trailer on that other fly. I can find them here. But I think the two's just fine. A little short chain hook. You want something with a fairly straight eye. And just tie that on with whatever knot you want. Just a quick dig in right there. So all I've done is I've run my leader through the tube, and I've got behind it a hook tied on. Now, I just pull my leader through until the hook, this may take a little bit of a helping hand, you have to kind of push the hook in there, but you just kind of pull the hook up into the tube, show you what that looks like. So our hook is now stuck in there, sticking out the back of the tube. And there's reasons that we do this. We don't just do it because it's more complicated and fancier than it has to be. Um, tubes actually fish, I guess, I would put hook down. That's to heal the fly even better than the dumbbells grow by itself. Puts a hook 
at the very far back end of the fly. Uh, so we you know, have a better chance if fish grabs short to hook it. Uh, the other thing though, is that's a short shank hook on a large fly. The traditional streamer hooks, the long shank ones, unfortunately, this one included, um, fish can get a lot of leverage on. And as you're fighting them, they can actually use that leverage to pry the hook out of their mouth. And, you know, it's not grazed well, they can also use that leverage and sort of wear a larger hole in their mouth and it can injure the fish more. Short shank hooks don't have that issue. The fish can't get the same leverage on. So you actually tend uh, to lose far less fish and injure them less. So that's a nice plus right off the bat. The other nice thing is obviously you can replace the hook as necessary. So yes, this was a semi-time intensive fly. It's not sure if I stab myself. Um, but if I dull that hook out, hitting a few rocks here and there, or even just, you know, hooking a bunch of fish, um, I don't have to toss the fly away afterwards. I can replace that hook as needed, uh, which is a really nice plus. Uh, so a, a few pluses to that. Just, those are the same reasons we use shank flies. This is just a different way to rig a trailing hook fly, essentially, uh, but a really effective one. This is a, a really nice fly. I like these guys a lot. Yeah, tubes, shanks, hooks, time, however you like. Those are all really productive flies around here, things you can feel confident going out with. And uh, try not to overthink it, really. Just put something in the water and get fishing. You'll find those fish. No problem. Yep, those are your steelhead flies.